Okay, everybody. Um, thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, so just a few housekeeping, housekeeping items before we get going. Uh, we are recording this, uh, so we'll be sending out a recording of this. Um, at the end of this uh, webinar, it should be about an hour's in length. Each We have four presenters, each doing about 15 minutes worth of presenting. Uh, we'll have time for a Q&A session. Uh, also, just so you know, the order has changed. Originally, it was supposed to be Transforma Insights, followed by ONCE, followed by ITRA and ITRON. And uh, ONCE will be a little late to this, so it'll be Transforma, followed by ITRA and then ITRON, and then ONCE. And with that, uh, let's begin things. Uh, Matt? Yeah, thank you. Okay, let me stop sharing my screen. There we go, and hopefully that's working for you. The joys of doing all of these things over Zoom rather than in person, which is the uh, the delight we've all had over the last few years. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Matt Hatton. I'm one of the founding partners at Transformer Insights. Uh, we're a technology research and consulting firm focused on the world of digital transformation, IoT, artificial intelligence, edge computing, a whole bunch of other areas. And today I'm going to share some perspectives on smart cities and the increasing importance of device management. Uh, and uh, to get started on that, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, defining and sizing smart cities. What is a smart city? Well, effectively, the way that we think about it is as a subset of IoT. But it's more than IoT, but we tend to think of it in, in, in those terms. OK, so. Um, it also might include smart government, it might include a whole, whole host of different things, but we think of it as a subset of, of IoT. Key applications like CCTV, public space lighting, environment monitoring, uh, use cases relating to transportation and so on. Um, what I'm showing on the right hand side here is a, a chart of the forecasts that we at Transformer Insights have produced, uh, where I've pulled out some of the smart city applications or those applications that we see in the probably the key smart city ones so cctv and street lighting and road pricing and a variety of other, other use cases as you can tell not a hockey stick growth but then really none of iot is and there's another thing to think about here is we're talking ostensibly about smart cities today but you could almost include anything within smart cities it includes smart grid, connected cars, supply chain. There's an intersection with a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so a lot of these smart city dynamics have an interrelationship with other technology areas, other verticals, and they also have similar sorts of dynamics and similar sorts of, of, uh, of uh, trends occurring in them. So when I'm talking about smart cities, a lot of the trends also apply to the rest of IoT. One of the things that um, defining IoT in the 2020s is an increasing diversity of technologies that are being used in order to connect devices. Okay, so historically, then you, you might have thought of, okay, for wide area connectivity, you'd use a GPRS device. For short range, you'd use a, a, a Wi-Fi or Zigbee. Uh, but what we've got coming through or have had coming through for the last five to 10 years is a range of different additional tools for addressing these these connections now that's great because more tools means better abilities to differentiate between the different requirements of different applications so you can better serve different applications but it also means a certain amount of additional complexity which i'll come on to later the point is that what i'm showing on the right hand side well on the left hand side just demonstrating different technologies for different use cases uh based on what bandwidth you might need where uh what the sort of range might be required for uh, for an application on the right hand side what i'm showing is the diversity of technologies within those smart city applications that i showed on the previous slide and which technologies are being used so what that illustrates quite neatly is we're going from a world where really it was only two generations or types of technologies that were important to a much more uh, diverse set of technologies. And particularly, low power wide area is, a, is, is an interesting area to, to look at. When we think about the increasing diversity of technologies available, this is ostensibly what I'm thinking about, okay? 
it's it's a combination of both the licensed technologies, narrowband IoT and LTEM, and uh, the unlicensed ones, amongst which include uh, LoRa and Sigfox as some of the, 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 the prime examples. Um, what I'm showing on this chart is uh, a whole range of different applications to be used in uh, across all of all of IoT, and I've highlighted in blue the smart cities applications. And what we're showing is the the variation in the bandwidth requirements and the power consumption requirements. So down in the bottom left, you've got those applications which generally only need very very uh, a small amount of data to be sent and have generally very low power consumption. Uh, track and trace, environment monitoring, infrastructure monitoring, public space lighting, and so forth. A lot of smart cities applications fit in there. And there are a lot of devices altogether. Four billion low power wide area connections in 2030, we expect, up from about 220 million at the end of 2019. Now, this creates some challenges. Okay, because it's low power wide area, you've oh. got um uh limited downloads which necessitates a rethink on over the air device management Arno, i think is going to be speaking about this a little later for something like sigfox a technology like sigfox you've got data transfer capacity of maybe one kilobyte per day making firmware updates pretty difficult but even the higher functioning technologies there's a big incentive to reduce the traffic so as to maintain the long battery life so these lpwa techs um, are creating a, a bit of a challenge for device management. Um, and they're overwhelming the use for applications where human intervention is unlikely, which obviously also creates a, a challenge. Also, as you get to larger volumes, you tend to get more marginal use cases, sensors which don't individually justify a truck roll to go and reset it. If you're talking about a, a multi-million dollar wind turbine, then sure, if something goes wrong, you'll send a guy to go out and, and, and fix it. But if an environment sensor goes wrong, well, there's not really a, a, an economic uh, rationale for sending someone to go and go and repair it. Or well, there probably isn't, or possibly isn't. Moving on. Now, as I showed earlier, the, there's, there's a question of scale. Smart city connections are growing. And because those connections are growing, there's a big incentive for low touch or no touch provisioning. It comes back to this issue of environment sensor versus wind turbine. You want as low a touch or no touch provisioning as possible for all those billions of scattered environment sensing devices. Now, that's not just about SIM cards. There's been a lot of discussion in the past about eSIM and how that uh, streamlines the supply chain for uh, deploying devices. You put a device into field, it automatically connects to the correct network and off you go. But it's not just about that. It's not just about the SIM card. There's also things around APNs, device settings, SMS settings, all of which need to be updatable over the air, meaning an even greater importance for device management or uh, over the air device management specifically going forward. So just this sheer scale of deployments creates that additional requirement. Another big trend in IoT connectivity in the last couple of years has been the movement of application processing, including some quite sophisticated elements like machine vision to the edge and specifically the edge device. So sometimes it's the edge of the network and sometimes it's the edge device. The upshot of this is that the devices are becoming smarter. Uh, Bob Swan, the now former CEO of Intel, uh, said increasingly everything looks like a computer. And I thought this was an interesting quote because I agree. Increasingly, everything does look like a computer, except unlike computers, most IoT devices, smart cities devices, don't have a convenient human there to reboot or implement patches with the upshot that putting more smarts, more intelligence on those edge devices creates an even further device management headache. You've got more and more complex devices. And you might like to consider the fact that uh, the likes of AWS and Microsoft are demonstrating a particular interest in the edge as a complement to their cloud services, as a way of extending those cloud services out into a, a new set of opportunities. And that will be a, a big driver for the market. So lots of movement from them as well on, 
on the, the question of device management. So it's front and center for a lot of organizations. There's also the question of security. The device management and security have always been somewhat intertwined because that's one of the great um, drivers for device management. In a way, IoT has been a victim of its own success. The volumes of devices that we've seen, so we've gone from about 1 billion in 2010 to about what, 9, nearly 10 billion uh, today. So IoT is a bit of a victim of its own success. You've got a diversity and relative novelty of a whole bunch of IoT devices. So there are new threat vectors. I'd recommend checking out some, some companies like Pentest Partners who um, do penetration testing and, and they've got some interesting stories about uh, device security uh, uh, weaknesses. I don't have time to go into that in, in much detail. Uh, but the, the main point here is thinking about security has to permeate the whole of the process of developing an IoT solution. And so anybody who's developing an IoT solution needs to put their product through penetration testing, I mentioned earlier, uh, things like honeypot trials. There's a whole bunch of things that need to be done, but starting from um, the baseline of secure by design, you bake security into your development process, which means thinking about uh, device management. There's a whole series of regulations that have come out recently uh, in the US, um, I mentioned there the California Consumer Privacy Act, but actually it's, uh, there's a US-wide um, act now uh, just been passed. Uh, there, there are uh, other equivalent pieces of legislation or guidelines or regulations in, um, in the UK and the EU and Japan and Australia and so forth. A lot of the time it's just guidelines, uh, but it's quite a useful thing and provides a baseline of, of features for complying with that first idea that really you have to bake in security in, in, in everything. But a, a point I want to make that's particularly relevant when we talk about device management is this. There, there's this concept that you can't have too much security, but actually that's nonsense. You, you certainly can have too much security. Security is always a trade-off with other aspects like trustworthiness, but, but also a trade-off with commercial factors like reliability, profitability, time to market. And the key is not to bake in as much security as you possibly can, but to apply an appropriate amount of security that's balanced against your other commercial and operational requirements. But that needs constant review and iteration to make sure that it's a right size set of security. And this, of course, necessitates OTA firmware upgrades and a consistent way of doing that. Last thing I wanted to mention, um, we can't leave a discussion about smart cities without thinking something about the data that's being produced. That's after all why we're all here. And the ways in which data is shared within and between users is becoming increasingly complex. What I'm showing here is the concept of the, the data exchange, uh, infrastructure and frameworks for organizations to handle the exchange of complex, critical, valuable, and or near real-time data between organizations. Now, smart cities tend to lead in this because data is relatively freely available. And many, many cities are looking at ways in which they can uh, achieve the, the, their aims uh, by the use of better sharing of data. So uh, any smart city's value proposition has to include some consideration of data interoperability and things like common semantics and ontologies. And I think some of my other panelists will be talking about topics related to that shortly. So just to summarize, more complexity means more device management. We've got more devices doing more things. That's, that's for sure. There's a need, need to optimize the device management process to suit the new low power access technologies or to be more context aware around the, the different capabilities of these technologies. Edge computing means more sophisticated devices requiring more management. There's more need for localization. And by that, I mean low or no touch deployment so you can put it into the field and you don't need to touch it again. In fact, 
only else could put it into the field and you wouldn't need to touch it. There's also greater security risks and more requirement for data interoperability um, and generally less data stove piping, so more uh, sharing and, and exchange of data. At that point, I'm going to hand over to Stephen. Stephen, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you very much. Um, Firstly, uh, IHUP, as the organizer of this webinar, would like to thank our content partners, Transforma Insights, ONCE, and ITRON for their contributions today. And with that, let's let's start things off. So for me, um, Smart City represents an impressive microcosm of IoT as a whole. And the term that comes to mind when I think of this sector is density. And so we have a density of devices, and we also have a density of use cases of the data and what we can do. And with that, we kind of have to ask ourselves, why has, like IoT, smart city adoption been underwhelming? Uh, back in 2011, Ericsson famously predicted there would be 50,000 or 50 billion devices by 2020. And, you know, what happened? Um, so today we'll look at the smart city market and the keys to unlocking adoption. But first, let me just take a moment to uh, introduce IHRA. So our adventure started a few years back around a vision for massive IoT over cellular LP wands. And our, experiment, our experiences in the cell phone market in the 90s really shaped this vision. And specifically, if you look at that market, cell phones didn't really take off until it started to organize around global standards in the 90s. And IoT, of course, will eventually dwarf that marketplace. I mean, it's, this is gonna be much bigger than cell phones. But for our co-founders, it was clear early on that for IoT to hit critical mass, um, it, was, it would need to be standardized, interoperable, and scalable. Now, when we think of these terms, um, we often think of technology. And, and I think that's kind of part of IoT's problem. IoT is about technology, of course, but IoT is a system of system. It touches IT, it touches the cloud, and it touches operations. And, at the heart of this, we're talking about remote constrained devices that need to be operated efficiently and securely. So these terms, standardization, interoperability, and scalability, they need to be applied to things beyond uh, technology. And this philosophy leads to our focus at IATRAP. And so we really have an obsession with reducing the IoT cost, the CapEx cost, but also the OpEx cost. It's why we're part of the Open Mobile Alliance's SpecWorks boards and it has everything to do with our products and standardized device management. And now with that background, let's just look a little bit closer at Smart City. So again, when we look at Smart City, we have lots of obvious use cases with clear returns like lighting and, and, and improving traffic systems. And there's lots of secondary uses for the data. One example uh, of a secondary use I love is work that was done in Louisville, Kentucky. And so using data from GPS connected inhalers and other data points, Louisville sends SMS alerts to citizens on high pollution days. And so the results are really encouraging, which is they have fewer ER visits for asthma conditions and they have you know, citizens basically just improving the quality of life. Unfortunately, the Louisville example also illustrates the challenges of this market. So many of these opportunities are non-revenue generating opportunities and the benefits are indirect. And building these solutions, doing this today is just too costly. You know, Louisville, this, this thing was a major project. So it required federal grant money, there were public and private partnerships. And for smart city really to achieve its potential, we need to reduce the barriers to, to building these types of, of solutions. So another solution, another challenge we've seen in this market historically and IoT as a whole is connectivity. And, and Matt here today uh, did a great job calling this out in his book, The Myth of IoT, saying that, you know, IoT really needs a global connectivity standard. And we see lots of signs in the marketplace that NBIoT is a, is a big part of the answer here. Um, firstly, NBIoT is a great fit for a lot of smart, different, smart city applications. Uh, it's able to penetrate walls and buildings very well, it supports long battery lifespans. And of course, it also has the, the, the security, the carrier grade security, which is so important to so many of our customers. And there's other encouraging NBIoT developments, such as the chipsets keep getting better, uh, less costly, uh, we're seeing roaming starting to happen. We have eSIMs, 
you know, the, I think cost modeling is becoming more mature. People are understanding that some of the non-cellular LP, LP1s, that there's some hidden cost issues. And just in general around NBIOT and LTM, there's lots of innovation and enthusiasm. And then the final three things I think that are important to take note of when we look at this market is just a simple statistic. 80% of the world's population lives in cities. Um, we face unprecedented economic, ecological, and health challenges. And, and smart city solutions can be a big part of helping us address these. And then also smart lighting, you know, if we look at the different applications here, smart lighting is gonna lead the way. Um, so with that, let's look a little closer at why smart lighting. So smart lighting is, is a great smart city application. It has a clear use case with clear benefits. I mean, it saves people money and it reduces maintenance for what we consider a critical, you know, must have service. But when we look closer at smart lighting, um, there's some other things that become clear, which is many of the things that allow you to manage the operational cost are device management related. So these are things, you know, Matt touched upon. So commissioning, managing connectivity, the security, the data reporting, the firmware updates. So all these things are device management related and they need to be addressed really early on during the product and the software development cycle. Also, smart lighting solutions, like a lot of these solutions around the smart city are going to need to exchange data. Um, and uh, so smart, there's gonna be lots of different smart city data points and you're gonna to wanna to exchange data so you can build and add upon the value proposition. And of course, these solutions are gonna create a lot of visibility for cities with their own constituencies. So when we look at something like smart siding, the smart lighting, what initially is a pretty simple idea to grasp is really part of a much bigger ecosystem. Um, and this ecosystem will be complex and evaluative. So you can think of street, light, street lights as one of the colors over here on the right, um, in one color in the smart city ecosystem. But within this color, there's gonna be lots of different lights from different vendors. Um, so this is already complex and you know, we're gonna to need to identify the least costly way to manage these different lights from different vendors. Now add other devices and other smart uh, services like we saw with Louisville that you're gonna to need to manage as well. And of course, all this needs to be done securely and with respect for people's privacy. We need to keep in mind as well that this is gonna to need to be operated in the real world, real world. So devices and smart city services are gonna come and go. The personal building, using, managing these solutions will come and go. Opportunities and vulnerabilities will, will evolve and they'll need to be addressed. Uh, all of this is gonna need to happen in the real world over constrained, physically uh, vulnerable devices. So it, it turns out to be you know, a little bit more complex than people initially give it credit for. So what are the missing elements here? What is gonna help us get to billions of devices? You know, the numbers Matt talked about are nowhere near close to that. Um, how do we create you know, a safer, more efficient world? Uh, and so the answer to the questions goes back to our obsession and to our core vision. And our vision aligns around <laughs> something from actually from the PC world, which is we want IoT to eventually and smart city uh, solutions to eventually be something like plug and play. So you know, these solutions need to be designed from the get-go to embrace change and create value and have very scalable operational cost models. So all the lights should use the same underlying data objects for device management and data reporting. Uh, a city's connected objects should all have the same scalable commissioning, device management and end-to-end -end security services. And if you have a new employee, if you have a new device, if you have uh, an idea that you wanna roll out to improve quality of life of your constituency, you should be able to do this with just a few clicks of a mouse. It shouldn't be a major project requiring federal grant money and, and aligning you know, public-private partnerships. So if you think about that, if you go back to the Louisville example, what if this wasn't a project each time? What if everything was built on top of standards? And what if we could reproduce what was done in Louisville from San Jose to New Delhi, with just a few clicks of, the uh, clicks of a mouse improving the lives of, of billions of people. How does that change the dynamics of, of smart city adoption? And, you know, I just like to add, some people get this more than other people. ITRON, for example, who, you know, David Howard's gonna be on, is on the call here and he'll be talking about what they're focusing on. Um, they're really done with everything that's closed and proprietary. Um, 
And the reason why is as well, it addresses the basic functionality. It doesn't scale from a business standpoint. It doesn't scale from a human standpoint. It doesn't scale from a processes standpoint, but I'll let David talk about that. Um, this is something also that Matt talked about, which is this concept of operational scalability. So people in IoT, because we're IT people and because a lot of us have backgrounds in cloud, we often focus on data and the solutions, conveniently ignoring the operational side. And so the truth is sending out service people is extremely costly. We have this number here. This is something one of our customers talked about, but I've actually heard that the number is, is much higher than this. And so smart city, to get to the scalable critical mass side is gonna re require something you know, close to zero touch device management services. So everything you're gonna do from commissioning to operating a device to eventually decommissioning a device needs to be done very, very low touch. And uh, anything less just won't be economically scalable. Um, I like to think, you know, if Henry Ford, you know, he understood that the lower he could drive costs on the Model T, the more uh, Model T's he would sell. And it's kind of the same thing for smart city, which is the lower we can drive cost and the easier we make it to, to sharing data, the more use cases make sense and the faster adoption will eventually happen. Um, <laughs> you know, I think security is going to be another major challenge in this marketplace and something that to date really uh, hasn't been especially addressed. And so I think initially the market really focused on upfront device co uh, cost and security and operations were, were kind of put in the background. But we know the consequences of poor security. I mean, there, there will be hacks, there will be data breaches, there will be you know, chaos. Um, the good news is, is we're starting to see in the marketplace some progress being made here um, at multiple different levels. I think one level is just the awareness. But first, a few more details on security. So, you know, you don't need to go far on the internet to find out some, find some horrifying statistics on data security. And at IOTRUP, since day one, we have always prioritized security and, and um, it's just for we consider impassable, but simply put today, too little is secure. Um, and because we're talking about billions of remote constrained vulnerable devices operating in the real world, real world this is a real problem with the potential to spiral out of control. And so uh, I don't know how many of you heard about this, but just a quick story. On February 20th in Washington state, residents saw a radiation alert that was related to an IoT hack. And so I, I consider this pretty much an unacceptable um, situation. I mean, this just should not happen or we need to minimize this absolutely. And I think the, the sad part is, is that this needn't be. Um, a lot of things that were uh, built into lightweight M2M, uh, it provides a very comprehensive uh, security services. So, and I was unaware of this until recently, but David Howard told me that if you build your device using lightweight M2M, um, already your attack service is radically diminished and this reduces your testing cost also for the device as you bring it to market, which is really important for organizations as they look to build products for the marketplace. Um, I think there's more good news also. Uh, government is figuring this out. We saw the IoT uh, cybersecurity law, which is pretty comprehensive and they're doing basically a lot of the best practices they suggest align with lightweight M2M. And I think they made it uh, basically, they outlawed the federal government from buying insecure devices. So if it doesn't have firmware updates, it's not considered secure and the federal government will no longer buy it. And I think what we'll see is we'll see states and other businesses uh, fall in line with that eventually. So we'll kind of macroeconomic market forces. Another issue um, is data. And so, you know, the value proposition of smart city is, is three prongs. So you have, you know, efficient resource utilization. We, we want to use our resources better in, in, in our cities and our communities, um, better quality of life and higher levels of transparency. And all this done is done through the data. Um, so we know that smart cities need to be good at sharing data. And so they need to be able to do this internally through, so through the different organizations in the city, they need to do this with third parties, they need to do this with citizens, of course, securely respecting privacy. And how easily we're able to do this is gonna be linked to the rate of innovation. Innovation, Unfortunately, the research today uh, shows that we're having some issues here as well. This uh, 
Boston Consulting Group uh, says that many cities today can't even share data internally between the different city units. So the question is, is, is how do we get there? Um, and we think a big part of this, a foundational piece of this, is it starts at the development level using the kind of things like the IPSO data models that lightweight M2M supports. So um, incorporating standardized data models accelerates innovation and reduces the, the barriers to sharing data. So the good news is, again, we're starting to see progress here, um, to see more support for data standardization in smart city and other industries. In, in smart city, of course, there's US, USIFI, which is doing some interesting work in smart city to, to standardize the data models. Um, the Southeast Water Company has mapped out basically everything related to do with smart water metering data models and lightweight m 2 m So if you're building a solution there, everything's standardized. And that, that's under the umbrella of smart city as well. Um, and then finally, other industries like the Digital Container Shipping Association, they have a vision for tracking goods from where they're manufactured to your doorstep. And all this, this vision is built on standardized APIs and standardized data models. And like Matt mentioned, you know, different ecosystems, so logistics is going to eventually tie into the ecosystem of smart city. So it's really important, all this standardization work that's going on here. Um, at a micro level, I just want to talk about our customers, so Bioga. So Bioga, uh, IATRP's customer, is working on distributed energy solutions. Uh, and these solutions are, are under the umbrella of, of Smart City as well. And they're really interesting solutions, which is in the future, our houses will have batteries and solar panels. And during peak energy demand times, um, Bioga will let us sell this energy and then buy it, at if we want, at low energy and store it at, at low peak times. So. And this is really this is a really interesting solution because it'll create more resilient electricity grids. It'll lower CO2 production for electricity. It'll lower electricity costs for utilities and consumers. And of course, Bioga will make money. So everybody's interest here. Unfortunately, today, what is happening is, is Bioga's spending a disproportionate amount of resources on doing integration into the different devices that they're going to need to manage. So this is this is slow. This is costly. This is going to be very challenging uh, to sustain for them. Uh, it's a very resource in, intense model. So think about if everything was standardized here and everything had the same objects, basically they would be able to focus their resources on innovation and their time to market would be shortened and the cost of the solution would be reduced. So everybody gains. Um, this, is, this is a rising tide that lifts all boats. Um, and it also goes back to why we're not at 50 billion devices today and, and how we, what we need to eventually put in place to make that happen. Um, so what is Bioga doing? I mean, Bioga is basically telling their vendors to align around open standards like lightweight m m and to align around data models uh, that make sense. Um, so why work with IRTRUP? Our goal at IRTRUP is to help organizations overcome these cha challenges. Uh, we want to liberate the developers and free them up from all the complexity of building these types of solutions. We want to liberate the devices and the data. We want to liberate the teams that are going to have to operate these solutions. Uh, everything we're working on at IRTRUP is really around these ideas. Uh, we have our SDK, which simplifies the task of including things like firmware updates and security and standardized data objects and other lightweight M2M -M device managed services and Alaska, which helps organizations monetize these solutions. And of course, everything is built on standards. I wanna thank you very much for your time today and um, please contact us if you'd like to learn more. And David, I think you're up next. Great, thank you, Stephen. Uh, let me get the screen sharing going. Uh, where is the dumb thing? All right, are you able to see the presentation? Is that coming through? Yes, it is. Sorry, I, had, okay. I was muted. Yeah, no worries. Um, so for me, Start Smart City uh, represents a very diverse case uh, for IoT as a whole. Um, uh, I'll uh, uh, start by uh, introducing uh, myself uh, and iTrons. I'm, uh, I'm David Howard. I'm a senior principal research engineer at iTron Idea Labs. Idea Labs is an innovation unit within iTron 
to investigate disruptive uh, technologies and business models. Um, it's a startup style fail fast approach. We try many, many things. Uh, we develop MVPs and then transfer the, them to traditional business units as the business grows to a point where it's self-sustaining. Um, you know, uh, because we're doing, you know, startup style, um, we may investigate, you know, 10 projects at a time and, and you're lucky if one of those uh, becomes uh, uh, an actual business, um, but that's the, kind of the whole point of it. Um, Itron is uh, uh, a fairly large IoT company that, you know, some people have heard of, many don't. Um, we've absorbed many, many companies in the process. Um, we're, we're fairly big in the utility and smart city uh, solution provider uh, uh, market. Uh, electric water gas metering, electric distribution automation, and then on the smart city side, uh, public lighting, traffic, parking, safety, uh, and other uh, city and campus area applications. Um, the numbers here are from 2019, 2020, uh, we did close to the same, not as much growth for obvious reasons, uh, but uh, i give you an idea of kind of uh, who we are. Um, for IoT, for smart cities to be successful, uh, it needs to uh, displace existing business flow, workflows uh, by highly automating them in a way that is more cost effective and or provide a new or improved service. So um, right now, um, I try and we, we use nearly every kind of communication te technology. Cellular, cellular is one of them. Um, we lean heavily on it. Frequently, the networks that we were deploying are over um, you know really wide regions, uh, you know entire states, uh, you know very large metropolitan areas, that sort of thing, um, and they're hierarchical. They they could be networks of networks uh, with both wireless and wired uh, kind of technologies involved. Um, some of the solutions and services uh, we have: uh, smart parking. Uh, these are specific to the. Uh, smart city uh, side. I won't get into the all of the utility stuff, uh, but uh, smart parking, intersections, traffic counting, uh, traffic signaling, um, just a, a whole slew of different uh, kind of smart city uh, applications. Lighting is definitely the anchor. Um, that's the one we have, uh, uh, you know, really large deployments of. Um, and in cities like uh, uh, Paris, where the entire uh, inside the periphery, all of the lights are uh, monitored and controlled by systems that we put in place. Copenhagen, um, Chicago, uh, uh, New York, um, and, and then other many other areas. Um, so, you know, if we look at what the state uh, of uh, uh, smart cities are in 2021 from our perspective, um, we see that smart cities have many, many devices uh, and applications. Um, we can't make them all. We have to work with a wide variety of partners on both the device and the application side um, to provide, uh, you know, systems that can be, uh, um, you know, managed and supported over very long periods of time. Um, and in order to speed up adoption, uh, we feel it's really critical that um, a, an efficient, simple, common architecture be used uh, for device and data management to help reduce time to market, as well as um, the operations uh, and maintenance uh, and support costs, which were, I think Stephen mentioned uh, earlier is an issue that uh, often gets uh, overlooked. Anyway, the, in the first wave of IoT, there are a lot of obstacles. Um, some were hardware to start with, uh, and, and then, you know, some were kind of operations of that communications hardware, um, coverage, inconsistent support, lack of roaming. Um, you know, you, you don't want to have to go out and touch these things after they're deployed. We, we put out things that, you know, they have to be in the field for 10 or 15 years. Um, you can't go and change SIM cards, for example, right? You know, if the service changes over time, or it's different in one region or another, having, having to go out and touch the device or even having to touch it between the time it's manufactured and the time it's deployed um, is not 
uh, is not scalable uh, into the you know, millions and millions of devices. It's expensive to do that. So some of these things have been solved. Um, the, other, the other piece was that a lot of the devices were actually adapted from prior architectures. They didn't take advantage of the new capabilities. Um, and they're, they're ba basically vertically integrated one-offs, completely proprietary you know, from, from device through protocol, through application. Um, and, and again, that works for a really high volume application. But once you start having dozens or uh, hundreds of different suppliers uh, and, and dozens of different uh, devices or applications, um, it becomes a, a, a nightmare. Um, just a few examples of the, of the kind of uh, hardware that we work with, the, the, the SOCs and the modules and where, the, where we've used them uh, in the, you know, in the uh, uh, LTE um, NBIOT space. Um, so all of these are available now. Um, we're using them for uh, street lighting, electric water and gas metering, asset monitoring, um, it's really helpful that you can have a single SKU um, and deploy them you know, anywhere in the world. Um, some of the previous technologies that wasn't you know, possible to do that. Um, and now the technology is to a point where it, it also allows for you know, very long battery life, again, with a single SKU that works anywhere in the world. So what are some of these new capabilities of the, of the uh, NBIOT modules uh, that are out there? Well, again, I mentioned the global footprint, single SKU. They work on public and private license carrier. Um, they have built in uh, some features that didn't exist in the 2G, 3G uh, time, which are really helpful. Um, full IP stacks, um, security, key and certificate management, um, secure storage on module, um, application protocols built in. And in some cases they have uh, device management protocols built in. They all do actually, but um, there's a little issue with that in that it was a very um, uh, early version of lightweight M2M, um, which is fine for what the carriers need to do to manage their, uh, their, their modem, uh, but not so helpful for the uh, device management and application management of, of the device that the modem's connected to. And so at some point, it would be really helpful to get that rolled forward into some of the, uh, the, the more modern versions of lightweight M2M, which have uh, you know, fixed some of the initial problems. Um, so you don't have to you know, have a separate stack just for that. Um, the other thing that's really key here is that these modules now support secure application firmware on the module. Um, this allows you to basically extend the modem, um, reduce or eliminate some of the, the, the load on an application processor, um, and embed the network and security stack to make integration simpler. So again, the device manufacturers, um, you know, typically used to have to do a lot more. Now they could, in fact, do a lot less to bring the next thing to market. And um, just as a, an example here of the standards that are involved, the standards bodies and kind of where they sit, um, there's a number of different standards bodies. We're involved in all of these and more. Um, and, and really what we're looking for is um, coming up with a, a, a new common architecture for device to cloud. Open standards and modular architectures are key to enable the maximum reuse of, of you know, kind of common or standard data objects, formats, and methods. Um, device developers can use you know, simplified um, abstracted APIs, um, as does the cloud application developer. Um, kind of eliminating the complexity or hiding the complexity of the intervening uh, layers, which are now abstracted. So what are the benefits of this? Well, it really is time to market and the cost for the next thing. So as I said, we, we are a manufacturer. We, we actually build a lot of things and have bought companies that build things, but there's no way we can build everything, right? And, uh, and we don't want to. Um, so 
how do we how do we make it easier for our partners or for third party companies to bring their expertise in sensors, actuators, you know, all the different devices that need to be uh, on a smart city uh, system? Um, how do we make it easier for them to bring the next thing to market and reduce the cost? So one way to do that is to embed an agent uh, or an SDK uh, onto the uh, the LTE modules themselves and take advantage of the that secure firmware extension that they can do. That way, development, maintenance, testing, updating, security, um, and the device and application protocols are really confined on the module. And they don't need to be replicated by each device ma maker. So that's a lot of expertise you don't need. Um, at each you know, company that's making new devices or new applications. The, the non-recurring engineering and maintenance costs or operation and maintenance costs are spread out over all of the applications and devices that use that, you know, that agent or SDK rather than um, incurred on each one by itself. Um, this also has security um, uh, and, and kind of pen testing uh, implications as well, right? Uh, because now if there's a standard uh, uh, embedded agent and it's um, you know, well-designed, um, you have a very reduced attack area and a very well-defined uh, 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 kind of device that you can pen test against. So it makes that whole process a lot simpler. It saves a lot of money and time. Um, it, basically what it allows people to do is that the device and application makers can focus you know, where they add value on their device and their application, they don't have to implement or have expertise um, in, in some of the esoteric details of the underlying protocols. And you, if you think about this, it's no different than, you know, you, you would be expecting them to, you know, build their own LTE modem and build their own M, uh, LTE, you know, firmware, right? That would be ridiculous. It would take them so much money and so much time to do it. Uh, that they'd never make the next device. So we're, we're just essentially moving the bar out so that they can focus more on what it is that they do, you know, making the next thing, the next, you know, environmental sensor, whatever, um, rather than worrying and, and being expert at all the underlying uh, uh, machinery that allows them to, to get the messages through. Um, so, I've kind of illustrated that here. I'm showing a, a stack uh, and then kind of how it has been done, you know, the legacy way, which is the, the cyan, the blue. Um, essentially the, the device uh, developer would have to do all of the work, right? They would have to write all of those sections or, or integrate libraries and, and debug them and support them going forward and patch them going forward. And, you know, deal, deal with CVEs that come out for each and every piece of it. Um, now what they can do is really just focus on the application data and device attributes. Um, and the rest of it's kind of uh, embedded in um, the, the module um, and, and the companies that are providing this, this agent uh, for the module if it's not already on the module itself. So how do we do this? Um, the, the way that we've decided to do this, and you know, we've tried many different ways, <laughs> uh, but this is the way that we've kind of focused on now is to use um, a standard called lightweight M2M. Um, this is uh, through the OMA Specworks uh, uh, organization. Um, and, and essentially what it allows you to do, it does a couple of things. One is it defines some common functions um, that are and processes that are really you need them for every device, every IoT device, and those are kind of listed here: bootstrapping, device configuration, firmware update, fault management, configuration and control, and reporting. Notice reporting the actual application part of it is only one piece. Um, all of these other pieces here are you know had traditionally been done in kind of proprietary ways um, that you know, are really complicated. Um, they're not easy to get right the first time. Um, and then they have pretty large attack surfaces on them so that, you know, if you don't get it right, um, you know, you may end up with a security vulnerability. By encapsulating all this functionality in, in this one standard, all these common uh, kind of operations, 
um, you, you have now distilled down a lot of the complexity of bringing a device online uh, and, and made it easier uh, for someone to you know, build the next device. Um, but that wouldn't be enough, all right? So it's great that you have all the core functionalities covered. The other piece is how do you get an application and a, and a device to be able to you know, communicate whatever it is they're communicating without having to write a, a bunch of custom code to translate you know, the type of uh, uh, attributes or data objects that they have. And so the answer there is that in OMA SpecWorks, um, they, they define and have a public repository for um, uh, data objects uh, and uh, the attributes in them. So here's an example. Um, I've got a kind of a modem uh, or a, an SOC here where there's uh, uh, you know, embedded uh, stack. Um, there's a third party device, might have a sensor, an actuator, a street light, whatever, um, and then some interfaces to it. Um, and it's communicating with the cloud through a lightweight M2M server, through some very well-defined objects that exist, um, and, and some functions that you can do with those, with those objects. Um, digging into it a little bit in more detail, um, and there's a link at the top if you want to go and take a look at the, the registry and see what's already there. There are many, many device uh, data objects and, and models already defined uh, by uh, in this OMA uh, uh, library. Um, some contributed by IPSO, some contributed by um, USIFI, some by individual companies. Anyone can create them. Um, you can build them up, you can modify them. Um, and essentially what it shows here is, you know, an object ID, the instance of whatever the resource is, you know, on off, dimmer, how much power has been consumed, what color the light is, for example, whether those are mandatory or optional, if, whether it's a single instance or multiple instance, and then, you know, what it is actually is. And the importance here is that um, on, a, on the device side, um, if I specify object 3311, for example, which is a light control, um, when I register with a server, if I just tell it that I have one of the objects that I have is 3311, it now automatically knows what I can do, right? So, and, and how to communicate it, what's readable, what's writable, um, what format it's in. Um, don't have to rewrite code on the, on the application side. Uh, in order to be able to uh, manipulate the next device that comes online. So that's very powerful. Um, the other thing is, is that again, going back to the, uh, the functions that I showed you uh, previously, you know, if firmware download really complicated uh, uh, process. Uh, everybody implemented their, their own. I mean, on our devices, we have because we've acquired several companies, we have you know, half a dozen different ways to, to, to do firmware download uh, to our devices. Um, and uh, here's a, a common way of doing it now. This is using uh, Iodorops, uh, an example using Iodorops uh, uh, client. Um, you can see the code for it is, is quite uh, you know, condensed. There's not a lot you have to do. You have to define a you know, a, a couple of callbacks and uh, initialize them. Uh, and then the, the, the client itself um, handles the actual dirty process of uh, moving the blocks, checking the blocks uh, and, and finishing the actual firmware update process. And then again, this makes it a lot easier for somebody to do pen testing as well, because there's a nice well-defined set of functions that are there um, and, and, and it's going through a, a uh, a very uh, uh, limited set of uh, addresses and ports and protocols uh, that, that make it rel relatively simple to, uh, uh, to accomplish your pen testing with. So what's, what's coming next? Uh, so as we see it, um, uh, the, really the, the, the horizon here is that now we have um, some, some additional optimization happening on the cellular side uh, to reduce overhead and kind of improve battery performance for low or, or low energy performance for devices that aren't 
you know, constantly powered. Um, there's a thing called non-IP data uh, delivery. Essentially removes a lot of the packet overhead for IP uh, since 3GPP already has, you know, or LTE already has this kind of information. There's no sense in wrapping, you know, yet another encapsulating yet another addressing scheme. Um, it also has uh, security that is uh, much more opera, uh, much more optimized for, uh, you know, discontinuous connections. One of the problems with uh, the security methods that were traditionally designed for um, the internet is um, they have uh, they have to do session restores. Um, they they um, have ways to do this, but they're not super lightweight. Um, and um, particularly if you're on the UDP side, um, you you end up having to restart sessions. Um, you know, fairly you know pretty much every time you wake up and try to do something. So if all you're trying to send is, you know, uh, a temperature and maybe a couple other sensor values um, every 15 minutes or even every five minutes, um, it's substantial overhead for that. Whereas if you're using the power save modes in, in cellular and NIDD, you can be very efficient on it. So that's one thing uh, that that is starting to uh, starting to become uh, operational on some of the the MNOs. Um, another thing that's that's coming and that we're working with uh, partners like IOTROP on and, and some of the MVNOs is to embed agents um, into, uh, uh, you know, RTOSs uh, such as Zephyr and free RTOS so that they can be uh, embedded directly into the, uh, the modems and the SOCs uh, for the different communication modules. Um, again, this is, you know, to reduce the the level of effort to bring the next thing online. And then um, ISIM or EUIC, I, IUICC and EUICC, which allows you to a manufacturer to basically control um, the full life cycle uh, of the connectivity. Uh, kind of one NCE will be talking about stuff like that. I think I'm out of time. Uh, so I'll just throw this one up here and put my contact information. There it is. Thank you very much. And I'll hand this over. I think you can just grab it, actually. Good, uh, Arn, you ready to go? Yeah, I'm there. Thanks, thanks everyone okay. for having me here. All right, um, thanks. So I, I'm going for the last round here now, uh, talking a little bit about. Uh, let me share my screen. I hope everyone can see it right now. Is it working? Yeah. I hope yep. so. we're good. Yeah. So. Um, what, what I want to talk about is more about maybe one step back. We've been talking about device management and, and uh, the module side, uh, which was very important to understand. Now, one step back, uh, talking about the radio side. So all the wireless connectivity options out there. And what I want to do is to give a more, let's say, a rational overview of, okay, how to pick and choose the right connectivity in order to really see, okay, what do I get out of it? And before I choose, uh, I think it's very important for every customer who wants to go for a smart meter, a smart city project um, to go for, to, to ask you the key questions. Uh, so the first one is availability and coverage. And you might wonder why this is here, but I've been talking to customers who've deployed or who've designed their whole street lighting application, for instance, uh, on NB IoT and LTM. Right, and, and they said they want to scale globally. And I just said, how can you do this? Because it's not available yet everywhere. Or you have to go to every operator in the world and negotiate um, with everyone. So just make, make yourself a picture about the availability. And I think it has been mentioned before, other respective technologies already given in the respective areas where you want to deploy a solution. This is very important. Second one is of course longevity. You need to make sure that the technology will be there over the time. And we've seen a lot of applications uh, uh, not just lasting for two years or so, uh, they're supposed to be there five, 10 and even 50 years in the field. Of course, then the technical requirements of the technology itself and, and the, the, the requirements of uh, the feasibility, where is it being located? What are the specific uh, specifications of, of, of the radio standard itself? They need to fit to the solution and, and, and their requirements. What do you want to get out? 
And of course, the bigger a solution becomes security becomes an issue or a concern that needs to be taken care of as well. So I think there has been a lot of buzz around all these technologies and we've been talking today about NBIT LTM as well. And uh, just wanted to make or emphasize one thing here, which uh, we saw because there are certain myths and, and misunderstandings about those technologies, uh, especially when it comes to the comparison of NBIT, LoRa and Sigfox and you name YSUM and all the other LPWA standards as well, um, saying, okay, they're all meant to last for 10 years. This is not true for NBIT and LTM. Of course, they are designed to be to last for, for 10 years, but please always make yourself aware, the more you want to transmit data and yeah, the, the more it goes up for, for the power consumption of the device. So this is always the, the, the kind of rational or ratio you need to take into account, which is something very important to understand and why there is some, sometimes a misunderstanding of the longevity of NB-IoT. However, we're talking about smart cities and you see a lot of applications that are not necessarily needing battery power. For instance, if you think of street lighting, uh, they come with uh, electricity uh, in themselves. And so you can power a lot of the devices through the uh, electricity of the city itself. However, this is always important. This also applies for certain factors where you, for instance, want to go for regions where you want to, uh, for instance, with MBIoT, go for a, uh, maybe a cellular or a very hard to reach uh, area uh, or location, then of course NB-IoT is supposed to iterate the signal over and over again so that all the fragments finally uh, arrive at, at, the, at the data center or the tower or it's there. However, this iteration, they come at cost of battery power. Yeah, just take this into account. Um, However, uh, you can see, of course, NBIT, LTM are supposed to transmit even larger data volume, which is important to understand, which is not just due to its uh, capabilities, it's also due to regulation. So they're not limited, such as LoRa or Sigfox. They're very much, LoRa and Sigfox, they're very much limited due to regulation, um, since they're utilizing the 868 megahertz uh, band, which is very much, uh, a free and unlicensed area, whereas NBIT LTM are allowed to, to go for higher peaks. And yeah, maybe just look at the numbers. And I guess a lot of you guys out there have seen this kind of uh, comparison and features uh, very often before. And maybe let me just point out two or three things here. I think the first one is, of course, yes, NBIT LTM are supposed to somehow peer to LoRa Sigfox when it comes to link budget. And hence, they are very suitable to go for a, a better indoor penetration, especially NB-IoT with an increase of, of the link budget of 20 decibel, which is great. However, um, when you look now uh, up to the battery lifetime, the module itself, it, had been, it has been streamlined. It has been ripped by a lot of uh, features, which come, of course, at cost. And those costs are the transmission power itself. So it does allow for a peak of 250 kilobytes per second. However, the reality of course, again, looks different. Um, I usually say, take this value uh, divided by five or even 10 and you are more closer to the reality, right? So the, the maximum or the typical transmission speed somewhere lies about the 25 kilobits per second somewhere in that area. It depends, of course, of the location itself and the, uh, and the uh, yeah, how, how far it is away, the device is away from the next cell tower and so on. And then, of course, there are some uh, features that are still, when you take the narrow band version of category one, NB1 into account, uh, where it still has this kind of cell reselection uh, feature, which means whenever a device is moving, and changes the cell tower, then the, the cell or the, the, the modium needs to reconnect. So there's an interruption whenever it's, it's changing the cell. This I think will be overcome with the next version called NB, NB2. Uh, last but not least, this is important, the duplex mode. So NB-IoT only allows for uh, either one directional communication, either upload or download, whereas uh, uh, 2G, 3G, but also LTM uh, are supposed to have both 
full, full duplex. All right. Um, last but not least, and I, I, I want to be a little bit faster on this point uh, because I think we're quite out of time. However, what I wanted to, to highlight or emphasize is to, to, to look at the different uh, setups, how street lighting uh, projects are, are currently utilizing uh, the, the, uh, different radio standards. And of course, there are still uh, some cities that uh, go for wired connections, for instance, utilizing power line communication. And of course, this is very, very uh, feasible. It, it allows to, to really go for uh, this application because they're just utilizing the electricity network in itself, right? Of course, there needs to be done some uh, infrastructure investment in order to allow for the power line consumption, but also you need to take into account the power line consumption or uh, communication, pardon me, uh, faces still some problems, um, uh, especially with the ingress noise. So there might be some interferences due to the uh, yeah, double usage of the electricity line. Um, of course, there's also then more and more we see deployments, smart city deployments, for instance, for street lighting, where they're going for a mixed um, usage of, of uh, technologies. For instance, we see very lot uh, the, the, the combination of LoRa, uh, LoRa based street lightings that communicate to each other or they're utilizing a mesh network technology like six low pan or um, UMB. Um, there, are, there are several solutions and then they're utilizing, they're sending this data that has been collected throughout all the lamps in a certain area to a gateway which then connects through GSM, through Ethernet or LTE and transmit the collected data to the backend. And of course, this again, because this comes at complexity, because you're utilizing different technologies and maybe uh, through to the CTOs out there, the more you add instances into a solution, the more and the, the, yeah, the, the more difficult it gets uh, to really find the root cause when there is an incident, right? And uh, I see this uh, myself when, when we talk to CTOs, they're quite happy to have a lean and clear solution. Right. All right, and NBIoT, um, we see there are still now more and more uh, deployments, smart city or street lighting deployments uh, coming. Um, and the reason why is because they allow for direct communication from each lamp to the, to the, um, to the data center. And so you can avoid having gateways in between, um, but of course, there is no limit, and there is always a, a mix uh, or a, an eclectic, uh, yeah, a mix of, of, of technologies being used. Uh, we sometimes see always also mesh networks being used on the radio side, just for the interconnection between the lamps themselves. Um, of course, and, and then at the end, you need to take into account NB IoT LTM. There are cellular-based, license-based standards, which usually uh, come at cost because. Uh, the higher security and the standardized communication over those technologies uh, is something that comes at cost, that needs to be taken into account if you compare the different technologies. So and last but not least, I wanted to, to really emphasize this one, uh, which is a kind of rational pro and con list, um, which I would like to, to have at least every customer who plans, who is in the design mode, to, to really think of, okay, what kind of solution is best and most suitable for me to really compare, right? And I will not say that, I, I don't wanna say that this is final or, or this is really comprehensive nor exhaustive. It's just an idea. It's a collection of ideas that I have been uh, working together with analysts, but also with the team here at once. Um, and there might be other perspective, but just to give you an understanding of what I want to, to really emphasize here is that every solution comes with pro and cons. And for instance, uh, and I've seen already such kind of questions, still the legacy still is uh, utilizing 2G, 2G and 3G uh, for radio based or wireless based uh, smart city or street lighting uh, application. Uh, and very often then uh, uh, done by gateway based solutions. And of course this is, 
the, the advantages are clear because the, the technology itself is established, um, which is of course poor is the future proofness, uh, especially if, if, you, if you have built on 2G, 3G, everyone is aware of the phase out of those technologies. So the future is really 4G, it's NB-IoT, it's LTM, if you really wanna go for cellular based technologies. But however, we see other uh, types of, of deployments uh, that are, for instance, utilizing Wison or LoRa. We've seen these deployments in France, Hungary, Italy, Greece, and, and everywhere. Um, and what we see is, of course, they're somehow making a kind of mesh like mesh network like uh, communication throughout the networks. And, and the pros are quite clear. Very often, the communication itself does not come at cost. And even though there is no connectivity to the gateway, um, for whatever reason, there is an interruption or there is a uh, lockdown or whatever, um, they're still communicating to each other, which is cool. So they run uh, autonomously. The downside is clear. Okay, uh, you need to make an investment to establish a network infrastructure if it's not given in the city. Uh, for instance, if it comes at a proprietary solution like uh, low, six low pan, uh, or whatever, because those are, of course, very much tied to a vendor. And once a city or municipality has started to build upon this technology, there is a vendor login. So you, you cannot clearly change anymore. And, and then you have to go for the solution or start at zero again, um, which is, of course, then the case for many of those solutions. Um, but the, the, the benefits speak for themselves. So many of these solutions, LoRa, for instance, is already very widespread. And we see a lot of these mixed uh, solutions already being used and utilized in the field. And nowadays we see, uh, especially with one of our customers, for instance, FlashNet, and I think iTron as well, uh, is doing uh, deployments on NB-IoT in Sweden and Italy and Greece, but of course, China, uh, NB-IoT, uh, in, in China, they're speaking for themselves. Um, and the benefits are clear. Uh, even the module costs are presumably lower uh, and, and the battery lifetime is good. I just learned today from iTron that the module now also comes with already standardized uh, uh, infrastructure and, and features like having the right protocols in place and so on on, on every level. So, right, the standardization of those technologies like NB IoT, and you will see it that once we are an IoT carrier, we have standardized everything uh, from, from, uh, from the provision back to the servicing of our connectivity service. And, and of course, the data flows uh, through the license spectrum technologies. So there is no interference, no regulation gap, no changes of regulation when you look uh, to Europe and to USA, you will see very big differences and so on. It's standardized, it's the same everywhere in the world and scalability is given. Of course, a, a clear downside is the lack of roaming cost, basically due to the delay uh, of, the, of the roaming uh, agreements uh, between the bigger operators. But nowadays it is already quite in place and uh, one of uh, a very cool solution that I've seen even by some of our customers is that they leverage the multi-mode functionality of modems. So there are modems out there that can utilize NB IoT, LTM, but also 2G, 3G. And by you using those kind of modems, you make sure you can start already today and then switch to the newer technologies like NB IoT, LTM once they are there and uh, avail available on a commercial side. Speaking of multi-mode capability, I just wanted to highlight what ONCE is about. We are an IoT carrier, um, really very much targeting the low-end uh, IoT. So whenever it comes for application that need low data, that require a low bandwidth, or that come at a uh, low cost, we are very much suitable for these kind of solutions because we allow for all these kind of radio standards in a seamless way, NB-IT, LTM, 2G, 3G, and also in the future 5G. And how do we do that? We make it with a very new approach, how to charge uh, our customers. So every customer gets the same price. Every solution um, 
Now, every customer who wants to connect the solution just pays 10 euros, and then he can connect with our service up to 10 years and has not, does not need to pay anything uh, at all afterwards. So it's a clear standardized um, bundle as well, coming with enough data, with enough SMS, even though the SIM card cost is included. There is an open v VPN REST API. All the things you need in order to connect your device up to 10 years, it's already in the 10 euros. So uh, that's the way how to really target the low cost IoT market, which is very much driven on, on margins. And I think once is the best answer to it. Yeah, and by saying that, I wanted to say thank you and for having me here and how um, this was beneficial for you guys. Thanks. Good. Well, well, thank you. I think there was a question as to your name, Arn. So your name is Arn Esman with Once. Um, yeah, that's right. Anna. And um, and so uh, someone asked that in the Q. This is we ran a little bit long, but we're staying here for the Q and A. Uh, we've already answered some of your questions, but if you have other questions, please um, submit them um, to the Q and A section. We'd be happy to respond to them. Uh, let's see. So there, here's a question, Arn. I think you you might have an interesting perspective of this. From smart for smart street lighting, would private cellular networks have the most advantages, least advantages? I'm not even sure private cellular networks are necessary, but love to have your perspective on this. I mean, the advantages I think I already uh, have been. Uh, referencing in, in, in my speech. So it's that even the, the, the radio side is standardized everywhere in the world, especially when you wanna uh, compare it to LoRa or Sigfox where you have different regulations uh, here in Europe and over the ocean. It makes it very complicated to really make the solution uh, scalable on a, global, uh, on a global view. And hey, a cellular technology is, is the technology that has been standardized everywhere in the world. The only thing you have to take into account is, of, of course, okay, which band do I need to, to use in order to access to NB IoT in a given country? This might be, again, a little bit tricky, but this is always very tricky with every solution. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and, and I mean, I, I know Matt Hatton has, has talked about the, about the need for a global standard around connectivity and how that's really been a big missing piece of that. And uh, we feel from our standpoint that, that standards at all levels are key to creating the massive economy as a scale that are really going to unlock IoT and, and smart city IoT. Um, there's a question, another one for once here about uh, what is blockchain on SIM? Yeah, blockchain on a SIM is... Uh... So basically it's a, a combination of two technologies where we work together with a blockchain um, blockchain specialist called Uberge, which is uh, utilizing a device, a SIM applet being developed by uh, Gizik and Devrin, so GND. And of course, we just uh, are the provider or the, the enabler. We are utilizing our SIM card regardless of our connectivity offering, we're just the bearer of the, of the technology. And whenever a customer wants to, to use blockchain technology in combination with our connectivity services, they can do it. Uh, and the benefit is you can seal the data with uh, the blockchain services from Uberge in a nutshell. Okay. Um, we still, I think, have a few more minutes. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions out there? We're open to questions. You can direct your questions at individuals if you like, but at somebody. Again, we have Matt Hatton and uh, of Transform Insights and David Howard with iTron. Idea Labs, myself, Stephen Lurie with IATRAP and Arn here. Uh, there was a question, um, Stephen, about 2G, 3G, Switch off. I haven't been answering the questions as we've been going, but I'm, I'd be happy to yeah. go with some of the previous ones that were. Please, that were please, in there. yeah, please okay. have at it. Um, so the question for benefit of everybody else out there is: two uh, G and three G still active? Lots of devices utilize those legacy techs. What's the key factor, feature, system cost that can replace uh, with low power wide area techs? Um, I mean, the the, uh, the key thing is replacement. 
um, effectively you've got 2G and 3G networks being switched off. So, so the key factor is these technologies will be available in the medium to long term, whereas with 2G and 3G, um, clearly in, in many countries they won't. And it's not even a question of, okay, well, it's still around in some countries. Well, if, you're, if you've got to keep having um, fragmented SKUs or you've got to keep baking in a whole load of technologies only for one or two countries, you won't bother. And so um, there is that benefit of, of availability. And battery life would be the, um, the other big thing. Uh, you know, we're, we're getting towards 10 year battery life uh, for, for a lot of these low power technologies. And therefore uh, they will be streets ahead of what was, what was available with 2G and 3G. Now that doesn't, that's not necessarily relevant for certain applications. Electricity smart meter, for instance, isn't short on power, but for um, something that's remote, doesn't have access to power. Obviously that's a, a significant uh, element to it. Well, thank you. I, I can add just a little bit on that as well. I'm the, one of the things that um, you get with the, with the new, i um, you know, LTE and DILT is uh, extensive power saving uh, modes, um, which if you're running on, you know, battery operated or low energy kind of devices, um, 2G, 3G really didn't have the, the capabilities that are available on the, uh, on the new NB modules uh, and, and through those services. So that's kind of critical for a lot of applications. The one other thing I would add um, is you do tend to get, um, you know, better long-term service contracts, um, you know, for the, for the CAD M, uh, then you're going to get on any 2G, 3G service, um, as they are definitely kind of on their end of life, uh, cycle. Yeah. For, for obvious reasons, but there's an interesting commercial expedient for, uh, for switching across. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question here is NBIOT roaming available. If so, what regions anyone? Yeah, so we're, we're able to get, you know, I've worked on this um, extensively over the last uh, year or two. Um, there wasn't even roaming with the same carrier between countries uh, up until basically last year um, that started becoming uh, available. Um, and um, basically this year, you know, now um, there are some carriers, um, uh, T-Mobile for one, uh, which has roaming available in, in EMEA at least. Um, I still have not been able to get uh, NB roaming working, although a couple of the major MNOs um, have told me it, it should work between North America and Europe. I, I haven't seen evidence of that working yet, but I, to, be, to be perfectly fair, I haven't tried it since last December, so <laughs> it is a movie. There's a limited number um, of peer-to-peer -peer agreements or mostly peer-to-peer -peer, uh, agreements. So uh, Vodafone with uh, Deutsche Telekom, I think, and with Swisscom and Telia. There's, there's, there's a few, but it's certainly not common. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, the other thing I've noticed with, um, with NB particular um, is because it's not really in wide use, there's a lot of misconfigurations. There's a lot of things that are supposed to work and don't work. And so when you go and try to do it and, you know, you have to, you know, kind of poke at the operators to get them to, to fix things. Um, yeah. So it, it's still a little immature, um, but it's getting quite a bit better. And, and actually what I've found, you know, on the, on the M side, which is much more mature now, um, the thing that's worked really, really well for me um, uh, you know, going from country to country and having kind of consistent behavior um, is to work with uh, uh, the MVNOs that are out there, like one NCE. Um, that way they handle all of those issues and details and you can get, you know, um, service, um, you know, at, at either flat rate or, you know, metered rate uh, that's, it, that's over time and you don't really have to worry about the, uh, the local operator. They have those mm -hmm. agreements in place. I think you bring up a really good point, which is although you know NBIOT is a global standard, there's a real need for homogenization and rationalization of the market in, in the marketplace, and, and and people like once are having a good are having a, a good impact on that and making that happen. And and there's yeah, a are. real there's a real appetence for for these types of solutions as well. So that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the uh, key there is that you know a manufacturer can uh, can build their device. 
they can uh, essentially embed the <clears throat> they can embed the service right in the device, whether it's on a, a SIM and eSIM or you know now on on the upcoming iSIM kind of capability. Um, sell the device; it can be deployed you know virtually anywhere in the world. Um, get its initial connection to the network, and then uh, the MVNO will um, you know update the uh, uh, update the profile um, through this over the air capability that came with the UICC um, to be optimized for the local uh, uh, carriers that they have agreements with. And then over time, and this is really important, you know, that stuff changes, right? And traditionally the way you had to deal with that was to roll a truck and change a SIM. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, that can be managed over the air now. Can I, um, can I jump in on one that's just come, come through as well? Um, US carriers look to prioritize LTEM over MBIOT. What drove this? Um, Huawei drove it, essentially. It was the technology that was more or less owned by, by Huawei as, uh, as the company that bought Newell, which the technology was, was based on. So there was an element of um, uh, it, got, it got delayed rolled out in the US until there were some, uh, some vendors equipped to, to roll it out. Whereas in, in China, it was a much faster thing because um, it had had Huawei behind it and, and, and ready to go. But there was a sort of strategic decision, I guess, in, in across most of the US to, to leave with LTEM. Apart from, I think um, T-Mobile was- You've read it out. Oh, my brain isn't working well. T-Mobile does, T-Mobile does NB. Mm -hmm. They kind of led with it in the US. Yeah. Um, they, all the carriers are supporting both right now. Um, the, the bigger carriers, Verizon and AT&T. And, and I've seen in, in most of, now I haven't really, checked their, their coverage and capability extensively across the US. Uh, but in um, certainly along the West Coast, um, I haven't had any trouble getting um, uh, NB service uh, uh, anywhere I've been. Um, and even you know places like uh, Colorado and, and Minnesota, it hasn't been an issue. I think if you get into some of the, the bigger emptier states, you might, you might only be getting the M service out there, but uh, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't tested that. But I mean, it's the same in Europe. There's quite a quite a, a fragmented approach. Some some going with with LTEM, some going with I uh, with MBIOT, some going with with both, um, uh, some some going with LoRa. I think ultimately, though, it's a question of when, and not if, everybody has both technologies available. Really, it's certainly in developed markets. The one thing I would really like to see, and I haven't seen yet, is a is a is a sim that works uh, because the modules are capable of doing uh, M and NB, uh, many of them. Uh, but I haven't seen a sim that works on on both. Um, so that would be uh, something interesting if that uh, mm -hmm. ever happened. Um, here's a, just a quick note here, and uh, this is good for once here. Someone wrote in here that said they've used a once card uh, SIM in Spain, and it works for both uh, NBIOT and LTEM. So that's always nice to get that during a meeting. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, listen, uh, the, the questions uh, look to be slowing down. Let's see. Someone asked, can we make the Q&A session accessible afterwards? Yes, we'll make that accessible afterwards. Um, I think that's that's most everything, um, and we're running out of time as it is. We've got a little thing. Just want to uh, quickly uh, give people a last little bit of information. Up on March 10th, uh, we're going to be doing another webinar on uh, NBIoT device sustainability, and we'll be doing that in focused on Southeast Asia. Uh, we'll be working with M1, with GSMA, and Mirata talking about some of the issues there. So we're looking forward to doing that. And, and if you're interested, please sign up. And, um, and just want to thank all our panelists today and everybody who attended this. Um, thank you very much uh, for your interest and, and hope this was beneficial to you. And we'll be providing a, a copy of everything. <laughs>